Hello, um, nice to be here. I'm not wearing my standard clothes, but I decided to wear a black suit and a tie since the president recommended that women dress like women. Uh, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to show you an example of um, some of the problems that come up. I'm a statistician. I'm a professor of statistics in this department. I was hired to do data science more than 20 years ago. And um, I find that some of the difficulties that come up in my work are the multiplicity of choices and getting worried about doing the right thing. And I'm going to show you that there are ways around that problem and that we can make our work reproducible and not spend a lot of time oscillating about what's right and what's not right. So the challenges in the type of data I work in, I work in biomedical data, I'm going to talk to you about the human microbiome, are heterogeneity, um, problems about information leaks, that occur. Now, we talk about big data, but actually as a statistician, um, I mean, we never have enough data, so we have to be very careful that we keep the power in our studies by keeping all the information possible. We have these big challenges of data fusion, that is, we have to integrate trees, images, networks into our data structures. And then, as I said, we have this multiplicity of choices. And I'm going to show you a few examples from the work on the microbiome. So one of the things is, and I'll take this one as, as the main example, um, even if you don't know anything about it, you all have a microbiome that you should care about. You have more cells in your body which are bacterial than you do have human cells. And um, they're the factory that makes the chemicals that we need for our brain, for our body to function. So it's really important, this microbial ecology which is going on inside our body. Now, new technology over the last 10 years enables us actually to have the fingerprint or the barcode of all the different bacteria and know what's there. And so just to say a little bit about what the data are, um, we have a genetic signature for one particular gene, which is a gene which is highly conserved in most bacteria, but has tiny little um, variable regions. And these variable regions enable us to exactly say, this is staphylococcus, which is there, this is um, E. coli, and we can even say what the abundances are of these different bacteria using the um, sequencing data. We can also say what genes are expressed, which ones aren't. That's some, what we call tra transcriptomics. And then we have proteomics, which allows us to measure with mass spec what are the chemicals that are actually being made, the metabolites, which are really important to the body. And with this, for each sample, we know a lot about the person who provided the sample. So we have clinical information about the history, the immunology, uh, immunological history about these patients' clinical status, the medication they're on, their weight. All these variables are really important. And we have environmental information, for instance, about nutrition, the time, the season, the location at which the samples were collected. We integrate domain knowledge and databases are very important. So we have um, long-standing projects where metabolic networks are known, phylogenetic trees are well understood. We have gold standards that we use and we have gene ontologies. Now, for me, everything is data. And sometimes biologists t tend to cut up their data into pieces and um, maybe I want to blame the NSA for saying there's data and there's metadata and they're only collecting metadata and then the data they don't collect. But for me, everything is data. So you want to be able to keep everything together in order to make um, useful analyses. And this is the sort of setup that we have as we go through. We start off by having the samples themselves on which we have these measurements. We have the clinical variables. That's the lower left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we did this processing of sequencing. And we actually create um, the data tables, which are contingency tables in which you have different species and you have counts in these um, data tables. And then we put the phylogenetic tree and all the information all into one object. So we create this object, which is actually, um, it uses what's known uh, as an object-oriented approach where we have heterogeneous pieces which can be all combined and linked, sort of tied together. 
and we use what's called S4 classes in R, but that's, um, you know, that's the way we set it up. But the most important thing, I think, is that today's data, uh, the really hard problems are problems in which we don't have a response, so it's not learning. Uh, you don't know uh, what's going on, and the questions are, we have all these different types of measurements, multiple tables, and we just want to know, you know, how can I summarize it, how can I understand this complexity? So these um, object-oriented approach has been uh, very useful. We made a, um, a software called PhiloSeq, which is an R package, which allows you to, in one line, to make a nice plot, to interact with the data, to visualize it, and um, have all the standard summaries with confidence regions at the si same time. Unfortunately, many of these tools came from ecology. In ecology, we try to make very qualitative descriptions. When you come to clinical science, in the world of clinical trials, people know this well, you need p-values or you need confidence statements, and you have to be very careful about the power. Janet earlier on talked about heteroscedasticity. That's one of the main challenges that we have because the sample sums, the number of contingency table um, sums that we have, they're all extremely different. And so people then say, well, we'll take proportions or we'll take subsamples or we'll take logarithms. But in fact, there's a really interesting and hard statistical problem, which is how do you normalize the data so you don't lose any information? Now, I'm not going to give you, of course, this is not a long enough talk that I could go into the technical part of this, but this, we have tools in statistics which allow you to say, okay, the arc tangent hyperbolic is the right transformation for this. And the choice of the transformation, transformation is actually an important part about not losing information. Now, I'm going to give you an example of why I say there are so many choices. And to, to give you an idea of this, let me just take, um, and I'm thankful to the technical um, staff here because they allowed me um, to take this example and run through to, in complete honesty um, an ordinary study of this data. So if I can come to, my, um, to the screen now on my, this is the example and um, on this example, you see, I have this picture. This was published in Nature, and the, the conclusion of the paper was there are three types of microbial ecologies, like blood types, um, for the bacteria in the gut. And if you look carefully, you can see that these um, samples are labeled, so Japan, Japan, uh, France, Japan, Japan is down here also with Italy and so on. And so the types are not actually geographically related, but these groupings tend to think that the data are actually clustered. And we wanted to go back and find out, well, if we reanalyze the data, would we find the same thing? So we got the original data and we looked at what they'd done to the to the data, and this is what you have. So first of all, what we see is that there's a lot of missing data. This first line is, you know, this is the janitorial work, but when you see that there are 50%, more than 50% missing, that's already um, a, a problem. And so once the, the data, the missing data have been taken out, then everything was renormalized to one so that you have proportions of what's present. And then we see that the labels for the type here, for instance, we have nine missing. This means, in fact, that the people who analyzed the data when they were doing the clustering, they decided to drop nine out of the 41, uh, 42 uh, ob samples, observations. And then you start to worry about why did they choose those nine? Uh, what was the choice that motivated that? So we tried to do some multivariate analysis, and so this is multidimensional scaling or a version of PCA, which is based on eigenvalues, on the distance that they used. So in their study, they used the Jensen-Shannon distance. Now, for anybody who does any kind of classification, we know that um, there are many different kinds of distances. The standard um, distance actually for this kind is the chi-square in which we have what's called correspondence analysis when you do a chi-square table uh, on, on this data. But we also have the Bray-Curtis distance, which is a distance between proportions, which the ecologists like a lot. 
And so when I said about multiplicity of choices, there's a real problem there. And in fact, we chose to loop through all possible distances available as, to us in R, and we made these clumpings. And actually, if you look at all the plots, you see that, well, they're not always um, very well separated. You don't get clustering, which is dependent on, on the independent of the, of the type of distance that you use. So you might use a different clustering variable, and you can ask the question, you know, how many clusters were there? So the authors of the paper decided that there were three clusters, and the way they did it was completely heuristic, but we actually have pretty good criteria, metrics for deciding how many clusters there are. There's Kalinsky and Harabas is one method which gave an optimal number of clusters at four and not three. You can use the gap statistic which chose two. Um, and if we go back to what they actually found and we choose the same distance, the same three clusters, this is what we found. And so we found uh, clusters which were much broader than the clusters as they were published in the paper. Now, the blue and the red haven't been inverted, but um, that's just because the eigenvectors are only known up to a sign. But in fact, the, 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 the ellipses are, are broader. And when we went back to see is they took the cluster labels, one, two, three, and then did supervised learning to try and make a plot which shows the best separation um, between the three. So there was an extra step which was done. I don't think any of this was done maliciously. I think that some of the choices were unfortunate. And the only thing I can say about this is that if we redo you know, the analysis in a different way, and this is a study, um, this is a minimum spanning tree that we made instead of clusters, we came to the conclusion that there weren't three clusters. There were actually an inherent gradient that you see between all the different samples. Now, the reason I showed you this, thank you, if we can go back to my, um, go back to my, and to summarize this is I wanted to be honest and go through a real summary and say, how many different ways were there of analyzing that data? Well, in fact, I had to choose what the transformation of the data was, and I showed you we can use proportions, original ones, you can subsample, we have regularized log, which are used for variance stabilizing to get rid of the heteroscedasticity. Other people just use the logs. So that's already five different choices. You, they took a subset of the data. They took nine um, outliers out, but you could have taken eight, seven, six, and we could have also chosen different outliers. So there, there are at least 100 different choices of the actual data that you choose. They filtered out some of the taxa, and you can decide to filter out the very rare, the rare, or just um, keep the core. And so you have different criteria for choosing the taxa. We had to choose a distance. So the standard distances, there are about 40 of them available in R. You have to choose an ordination method, a graphic uh, method, and an underlying continuous variable. The conclusion is there are more than 204 million ways of doing that analysis. And although I'm a statistician, Benjamin E. Hopberg and post-selective inference do nothing for you. And so what you need to do, and the only way around all these choices, is transparency. That is. Don't worry, do something which is sensible and in the supplementary material or with your colleagues if you're working in a company, you show your code and if there are a couple of lines where they say, well, what about if you did this different normalization? You look and see if your results are robust to changes, then the conclusions are still valid, but you don't have to waver about, well, I mean, is there a right? There is no one right choice. There are lots of different choices. And I think that I see a lot of people um, just starting in data science, and it's like when you start writing a paper, you want to have the perfect paper written straight out of the ink. You can't have the perfect. You, it's an iterative process, and we start with as good as we can get, and we try to make it better, but then you publish what you have. And um, that's the, we have now a system in which every click 
that you make is recorded, so we have provenance tracking, so we can take count and publish all of this. So on my website and um, a supplementary material, you'll see there are many instances of this reproducible um, research workflow which have already been attained. And we do interactive graphics that way. And we have work in progress where we're trying to predict, for instance, preterm birth using the vaginal microbiome. And this is shown to be um, reproducible. That is, we've actually replicated the, the study. And I want to thank the statisticians who make all their work open source, because I use a lot of their work. But we have a GitHub community which is extremely strong. And our studio in particular, the people from our studio are important to me and my collaborators because I'm an academic and I have a lab group in which there are quite a few women. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for a great talk in both substance and style. Um, what you mentioned at the very end about the need for transparency, especially in publications and sometimes people would like to pr provide very good results. We do run into trouble when we try to publish and the results are either negative or interesting or variable and people say, oh, but this is not very clean or I don't see a good enough improvement in your p-value or your f-measure or anything of that sort. What would you say to the academic community to really start valuing transparency over the perfect seeming but maybe not so perfect results? Well, I think that the problem is the motivation is the narrative very often driven by the biologists who really want to have a nice story to tell. And um, real problems, and I think you have to be honest about them, they're quite heterogeneous and messy. That is, if you have a really clean story, it's probably wrong because it was invented, it would have been found before. And I think you, a certain level of honesty. I think that there are many publications now who are giving priority to openness and providing um, reproducibility as a real criteria. And even if you publish something which just reproduces something else which was already published, I think it's very useful. And there are now journals which publish negative results. So we're, we're moving to a culture which goes away I, I don't generate p-values. I mean, th this is not what we do. We try to generate um, sensible analyses, and it's very hard to summarize all the complexity and the size of the data with one number. It's ridiculous. So, um, right. I, I, the culture has to move forward, so it depends on the young people. So it depends on you. And uh, so, so we're moving away from uh, the people who... I, I know there are certain journals, for instance, I know the Lancet and uh, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, call people like me um, uh, data parasites because we reanalyze data and we put our data out. We don't, we don't keep it. And so we're changing the culture, but I'm all for that. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Right along that. Okay. Thank you.